A very good afternoon to everyone. Today we are honored to have a guest speaker, Ms. Karina Adnani, who is very passionate about spreading awareness on importance of nutrition in improving quality of life. She has done her bachelor's degree in biochemistry from Boston University and successfully she is practicing her a nutrition program, which is Did I Eat That? With the aim to prevent a healthy lifestyle and to manage a lifestyle disorders by helping people in, incorporate balanced diet. So she has also co-authored a book, which is called Level Up. It's on healthier lifestyle with proper nutrition. She has closely worked with a meal companies uh, to provide a personalized calorie counted meals to our celebrity actors on the go. So are you, are you excited to know like what's the science behind the cravings and how effectively we can manage stress sitting with the healthier alternatives? So please uh, join with me, uh, giving her a warm welcome to Ms. Karina to share uh, the insightful session on Conquer Craving. Thank you so much for that introduction, Ekta. And a very, very warm welcome to all the participants today who have joined us on this wonderful evening, uh, learning about conquering our cravings. Now, before I move forward, I'm just going to share my screen as well. And I'm just going to, you know, ensure that all of y'all can hear me, see me, and that there is no lapse in the internet as well. I just, you know, switched my network so that there is no interrupts, uh, you know, interruptions in between. So if y'all can just give me a thumbs up in the chat box, that would be really good. So then I can move forward without any further delay. All right. So I see that in the chat box, I'm getting a couple of thumbs up. And uh, we had the Q&A box as well, where y'all can drop your questions as well. And we'll try and address them uh, towards the end of today's session. All right. So, you know, since we're talking about conquering cravings, right, many of us, we know that we have, you know, had some kind of either sweet cravings or cravings for comfort food or whatever our cravings could be, whether it's for salty food, carb rich foods, uh, you know, it could be for a specific kind of item that you have probably grown up with you know maybe your grandmother's recipe or your mother's favorite recipe which they have shared with you and you really remember that and you it brings up some fond memories as well right many a times when we have cravings for a particular item it is probably because you know some kind of psychological connection to the food or it is an interplay of neurons as well right so today we're going to learn that are these cravings as a result of the body wanting energy or food or is it you know, some other complex interplay that is taking place in between our body, our mind, our gut, right? We need to understand this better. How can we understand cravings, the science behind cravings? And once we understand the science behind cravings, we will be in a better position to tackle it, right? The goal is that when we have cravings as well, how do we acknowledge it, right? Many a time, we're so subconsciously you know, intertwined in this act of picking up a food, whenever we feel the need to have something in particular, that we don't put much thought, right? Many a times there is food lying right in front of us and we pick it up mindlessly without putting much thought to it, right? So today we're going to understand how do we, you know, break down this, you know, cravings phenomena? How do we understand cravings better? And once we understand and acknowledge them, how do we take care of all the cravings that we're having, whether it's sweet food, salty foods, as I said, you know, cravings for comfort food as well, right? We don't need to put a negative connotation to the word cravings, right? Many of us, we feel that, you know, we have a sense of guilt after having a particular food item, right? We feel guilty or shamed. We feel ashamed after having a certain food item and we feel that we're going to put on weight, right? We feel a sense of, powerlessness right we feel powerless around food so how can we really conquer these cravings and that will only happen if we understand where they're coming from the root cause of cravings right so what do we have in plan for everybody today we're going to start off with a small activity and in this activity i'm going to ask you a couple of questions so i want you all to be very very alert in the chat box and then of course we're going to go on to discuss what exactly does the word craving mean 
once we discuss the word cravings, we'll be talking about the causes of cravings and how to deal with them in a better fashion, right? Once we acknowledge the cravings, we know why are we having these desires to want a specific food item. We understand our brain chemistry and what our body is demanding. Then we will be able to address them in a better fashion. Right. So towards the end, as I said, I'm going to take all your questions, queries to the best of my capacity. And today's goal is going to, you know, be to help you all make an informed decision. At the end of today's session, you all should feel equipped with the right kind of tools to separate emotions, right, and actual hunger, emotional eating and actual hunger. The two are not the same, right? And we need to understand that what does emotional eating do in the long run? right? Many a times we use food as a coping mechanism to deal with our emotions, right? So how can we help ourselves, right? I'm not saying you stop eating altogether, but how can we make an informed choice? And today, if you're going to go home with a couple of necessary strategies, important tools that will help you make a better choice when it comes to your health, my, my goal today of, you know, bringing this session across and helping, you know, y'all understand the, the word cravings and how to tackle them better will be met, right? So my job of educating y'all will, will be actually met today if y'all, you know, understand the session and of course, take away a couple of key points as well, all right? So let's first get started by understanding what are these cravings, right? So before I get started, I want everyone to quickly be alert in the chat box, right? This one and a half hours is going to be very, very, you know, engaging, interactive, educational. Just, you know, sit back, relax, shut your multiple tabs. You want grab a paper and a pen as well. Take a couple of notes. That's totally up to you. All right. So I want everyone to just type in the chat box. Do you have food cravings? And do you have cravings in spite of being well fed? You know, many a times, after dinner or after lunch, we have a craving for a sweet, right? We have a craving for some mithai or we have a craving for some dessert. We crave a piece of chocolate or even for that matter, we like to keep munching on foods in between, even though we might not be super hungry, right? I see food around me, right? If I'm working today and I'm having a desk job and I see a box of chips around me, right? That again creates a feeling of wanting to eat it, right? So has it always happened to us or maybe not always has it happened sometimes that we've had cravings in spite of having food in our body, in spite of being well fed, even after a big meal, all right? So I'm getting a couple of answers in the chat box. And what I'm seeing is that, yes, mostly for sweet foods. A couple of people have said that it doesn't happen always to me, but sometimes. So yes, it's dependent from person to person, right? No two people have the same kind of cravings as well. So I want to know from you all now, what kind of cravings do you have? What kind of foods do you crave, right? Do you ever crave for, you know, a juice? Or do you ever crave for a, uh, you know, bowl of salad? Or do you ever crave for a soup? soup? It's usually for sweet foods, right? We are usually craving something like mithai or some kind of snack or some kind of favorite dishes as well, some spicy foods as well, based on your palate, right? Based on what you are liking, based on what you're used to. And for some people, it could be all kinds of foods as well, right? So everyone has different kind of cravings based on your likes, dislikes, you know, different kind of cultural influences as well, based on what they have grown up with as well, right? Now, is this craving for a particular food at an hour, right? Is it at a specific hour, at a specific time? And this is usually what I've heard from my clients as well. It happens post your meals, all right? So let's say post dinner, you have a bit of a craving for something sweet or, you know, post your lunch time when you're having that little bit of lull in your energy levels at 4 or 5 p.m., you crave something, right? So I'm getting a couple of answers in the chat box and just trying to read through all the answers that I'm getting. I'm getting a sense that it's usually, you know, the snack time or it is post dinner or before going to bed. This is what I'm getting from you all, all right? So yes, this is very, very common and you do not need to, you know, feel sorry about it, right? We do not need to 
uh, you know, feel guilty about the fact that I'm having this craving at a particular hour, right? There's a reason why you're having these cravings, all right? And I want you all to just assess, does it really depend on your mood as well? All right. Sometimes if I'm feeling a little low, I'm having an important thing to address or I'm anxious or I'm stressed. Right. Does that really dictate your craving? Are the two interconnected? Right. Uh, many a times, you know, when we're super anxious or we're very stressed out or we're very low or we're not able to cope with our own feelings we tend to eat in response to stress, right? This happened to many of us. Many a times we under eat as well in response to stress, right? We, our appetite shuts down, right? Our digestive system shuts down, right? And if we are bored as well, right? If we are not having anything to excite us, if we have low dopamine, which is the hormone that is responsible to make us feel excited about something, we get we get the need to eat something, right? We feel the need to eat something if you're bored as well, right? And if you're disinterested at times, you just feel like picking up a bag of chips and mindlessly keep on munching on it, right? Or pick up your favorite comfort chivra or pick up your favorite comfort farsan, whatever it could be, right? It could be lying around you as well and you're visually cute to pick it up mindlessly, right? So yes, mood, feelings, emotions are dictating our food choices and cravings all right it happens to most of us if it's not happened to you maybe it's happened to people around you right so we need to acknowledge this now after this we're going to be discussing what does the word cravings mean right and how are these cravings caused but before I move forward as I said I want everyone to describe how they feel let's say you're having a craving for a sweet food at you know, 10 p.m. in the night after dinner, right? What happens to you right after you finish, let's say, you know, a box of chocolates or let's say you've had a moti churka laddu or let's say you've had your favorite, you know, chivra or your favorite chips, right? You feel suddenly good. You feel satiated. You have a sense of happiness, right? That temporary time, you feel really, really good in that moment, right? And now the next day, what do we think? Oh, maybe I went overboard. I shouldn't have gone overboard. You feel a little guilty the next day as well. In that moment, of course, there's happiness. There's your serotonin, your dopamine going up and rising and getting amped up, right? Those hormones are literally running through your body. What happens the next day? You feel, okay, maybe I shouldn't have gone overboard. Maybe I shouldn't have finished that entire packet. Maybe I should have had a small bite and just stopped, you know, instead of going overboard. Right. So many of us have different kind of feelings based again on our own conditioning as well. Right. The goal here is to understand why this activity was done. Why am, why am I asking these questions is because I want everyone to acknowledge right, that they have had cravings. Their cravings somehow are connected to their feelings as well. And yes, you know, we need to acknowledge the fact that having cravings is common. Right. We do not need to. <clears throat> make ourselves feel low about it, right? We don't need to feel guilt and shame if I have a craving, right? So let's start off by talking about the word cravings, right? Now that we have acknowledged that, okay, yes, cravings are a part of our body. They are part of our lifestyle. How can we address them in a better fashion, right? So what are these cravings? Cravings are nothing but an intense, powerful desire to eat something specific, all right? As I said earlier as well, you do not wake up in the morning and suddenly crave a box of chocolates, right? It's a certain time of the day, right? It's a certain period or an emotion that you're feeling as well that plays out. And the craving comes at a specific time, right? When you have that food, you feel good. The sense of happiness, satiation, right? The sense of relief as well, correct? So food cravings are an intense powerful desire to have something specific and as I've asked you all as well you won't crave you know let's say a bowl of soup or a bowl of salad right right after a meal you won't have cravings for something that you probably uh, is not you know helping your palate which is not you know very very tempting as well right you want to feel good because you want your senses to be heightened right you want your taste buds to be fulfilled 
So somewhere it's a craving that is not driven by hunger. It's a craving driven by emotion. It's a craving driven by some kind of conditioning to sweet foods or specific foods, right? So as I said, these are very intense desires to eat and it depends upon the time, the emotion and the setting, all right? So we know that in a specific time of the day, right? Let's say post lunch or post dinner, you have a habit of consuming one small mitai or one small chocolate piece. It's a habit based on time right every night if you have a habit of consuming sweet foods then your body will give you a signal that okay i want to eat something sweet at this point it's also based on emotions right as i said many a times you associate food with comfort today for me if i see a small box of let's say say barfi right for me it reminds me of my grandmother and it creates a feeling of comfort it creates a feeling of memory right I, I go back to those days when I was a child and my grandmother would feed me that right so it's comfort it gives you a sense of you know some sort of memories are you know evoked in your body and mind so we need to understand that yes emotions and food they're constantly at interplay with each other right they're intertwined many a times looking at a food option will make you feel a certain way and many a times a feeling will dictate the food choice, all right? So they are intertwined. And also the setting is very, very crucial. So for many of us, if we are sitting on a desk and we know that we have a 4 p.m. or a 5 p.m. snack time, break time, okay? And all around me, everybody is having a cup of tea. That smell of caffeine will also make you feel like you want it more, you want it more right? That smell of coffee, the smell of something, right? Specific will also induce in you the desire to want it. Let's say everybody is consuming one bada pao. It's rainy season. The setting is very, very cold outside. It's raining. What happens to us if I see a colleague of mine having a bada pao? Even I feel like having it, right? So you're visually cued. You, you, your body is not asking for it. But because you see it around you, on social media, in an advertisement, on your app, on your phone, somebody mentioned about it, somebody spoke about it, you're cued, right? Your body gets a cue that you want it. That craving starts and kicks off, all right? So we need to understand that the body and the mind and the gut are at the interplay. They're constantly interacting with each other, right? Many a times your gut is sending a signal to your brain and your brain is sending signals back to your gut as well, all right? Your gut is called your second brain for a reason, right? So this com com complex interplay of neurons, this complex interplay of your behavioral science, right? How you are conditioned as well will dictate your cravings, all right? So the kind of psychological, behavioral uh, conditioning you have gone through in your childhood, the kind of foods that you're exposed to culturally, visually what foods you see, what time of the day, the emotion that you're going through, all will dictate your cravings. It's not as simple as we, you know, make it sound. Many, many times I've been told that, you know, it's about willpower. And there are many people out there in the health industry that tell you that it's all about willpower. It's all about control, right? It's all about keeping a check on your food. You need to have better willpower, have better control, and you'll be able to conquer your cravings. Haven't, you know, haven't you heard that or not? Yes or no? Haven't we heard that, you know, you should have better willpower. You should be able to better control your cravings because it's all about how you manage, right? It's all about mental power, correct? But let me tell you, my friends, it's not as simple as it sounds. It's a complex interplay of what your emotions are, right? What kind of conditioning you've gone through, what visual cues are present around you, the stimuli that are constantly you're exposed to, right? All this interplay will dictate your cravings, all right? So yes, you might have the best willpower in the world, but there is a lot of internal interplay. There's a scientific reason why you're having these cravings as well. All right. So why do we have cravings? The reason is plenty. There are many, many reasons. As I told you already, there are many reasons that cause these cravings. One such reason is the need for dopamine. Now, do we know what dopamine is? In the chat box, do we know what dopamine is? It's a hormone, right? What is the what does the hormone dopamine do to us? 
it makes us excited about something. Let's say, for instance, I give you two free tickets to Goa tomorrow. And I quickly tell you that you get two free tickets tomorrow. What is the first thing you'll do? You start packing your bags. You'll start getting excited. You'll get a kick in your body. You'll get a kick in your brain as well, right? You get super, super happy, right? So that is what? When you get excited, when you're anticipating something, right? The excitement you feel in anticipation to something pleasurable is called dopamine. The dopamine release in your body happens when you are excited about something, when you're anticipating something pleasurable, all right? So dopamine is a very important hormone in our body, right? This hormone is going to dictate how we feel about things. And many a time, people who are constantly bored, who have no purpose in life, who have no aim, they feel that the lack of dopamine is causing them to feel this way, all right? The reason is the lack of dopamine, the lack of this hormone which is gushing in your body, all right? So the first reason why we have cravings is because our body is constantly wanting dopamine, all right? And if your body is constantly wanting dopamine, what will your body signal you? That give me something pleasurable. Give me something to excite me. I do not, you know, I'm stuck in a rut, in a routine where I'm doing the same thing every day. I'm working, going home, doing my entire routine. I'm stuck in a rut, right? Nothing to excite me. No purpose, no no such, you know, outlet where I just feel myself, right? And then what do you do? You look for food as a source of dopamine. And what do we see in the food as well? Specifically carb-rich foods, specifically foods that are rich in fat, rich in oils, foods that are rich in sugars, the processed sugars, right? The salt, they are also sending signals to the hypothalamus. All right, so we have, we have the brain. We see an image out here, right? We see the brain. And there's a center in the brain called the hypothalamus. Okay, now this center of the brain is basically the center for appetite. And whether fortunate or unfortunate, this center is also the pleasure center for dopamine. All right, so what happens if I eat something sweet, if I eat something that, that is comforting to me? If I eat something that's comforting to me, right, those foods will send a signal. The minute I eat that food, right, there's a receptor. Then there are neurons that are activated, right? And this signal will be sent to my hypothalamus, right? The gut will relay the signal to my brain, right? My taste buds get activated, right? And the receptors, the brain receptors will get activated, right? These foods will attach attach themselves to the brain receptors and the signals are sent to my hypothalamus, right? Let's say I eat candy. Let's say I eat a bag of chips. Let's say I eat a carb-rich carb item, right? And whenever I eat these foods, my blood glucose spikes. The minute my blood glucose spikes, there'll be a sugar high in my brain, right? The electrical impulse from the receptor to the appetite center is already taking, taking place. And because the pleasure center is also the appetite center, there'll be a burst of, you know, good mood, better energy. I'll feel really great. Serotonin, dopamine are released. All right. So <clears throat> the need for dopamine is what is making us crave these carb-rich foods more. All right. We are hardwired to like sweet foods more. Why? Because in the evolutionary perspective and, you know, as well, we have grown up to favor sweet foods more. All right, now I will bring that topic up in the next slide, but we need to understand that these dopamine levels can be activated without having the unhealthy foods, right? When our body eats sugar, right? It gets a sugar kick, we get a sugar rush, we get a high, right? But we need to understand that other activities can also give us this high. Other activities can also give us a dopamine rush. Eating foods in a certain fashion, the way we eat foods, the kind of foods we consume can also give us a dopamine high provided we know the healthier options to pick. All right. So today we're going to understand that <clears throat> how can we pick the right food options as well, right? How do we pick and know the healthy items, satiate ourselves, make us feel pleasurable as well. At the same time, you know,
keep our bodies fulfilled and curb those cravings right so one such example of fear of the need for dopamine is let's say your dinner is over right so many a times you know as you all mentioned rightly in the chat box as well the minute your dinner is over the cue will be that okay i'm done with my meal and the next thing your brain will start because it is already conditioned right to want the sweet food so it will start thinking about where is my dessert kept where is that sweet kept and if it is kept on the table you will quickly pick it up if it's a habit and a routine you'll grab it right and the reward will be there'll be a surge of dopamine hormone in your body making you feel good in the moment all right this momentarily happiness right is what makes you feel good and then this cycle is repeated because of the brain's need for a reward all right so one such point i want to make today before i move forward in this slide is that cravings are not driven by your body's need for energy they are driven by the brain's need for a reward the brain's desire for the pleasurable dopamine and the good pleasurable hormones to be released all right so for all of us who think that okay i am maybe lacking energy or maybe my body is demanding something in specific cravings are not driven by energy needs your energy needs were already met during dinner unless the dinner was super you know uh, not satisfying you were under eating or you didn't clock in the good nutrients right you met your nutrition through your dinner or your meal or your breakfast or your lunch that post meal craving is something that is driven by your brain's reward center it's the need for a reward all right so now let's go to the next slide where we are thinking about how we are hardwired right we are hardwired to pick the sweet foods why let's go back in the hunter gatherer period right in the hunter gatherer period we know that people went long long days without food if they if they caught an animal or if they caught some food right very well and good they consumed it and they were well fed right but if there were periods of they couldn't find an animal to eat or they couldn't find food to fetch right they had to go periods of no eating as well so what did the brain do it developed a mechanism the body developed a mechanism to store food in the form of fat right so what did we start doing we started started storing food the excess energy in our body which is not to be utilized in the moment as fat reserves all right so that in periods of winter or in periods of no food available we can at least utilize those reserves but what has happened in the current scenario we have food available everywhere we can order food at the touch of a button as well right so we have food available every few hours right there's no shortage of food and because of that of the constant you know food availability too around us and the food habits changing too right that's where we're going that's where we're lacking we're going wrong right because we have food available all the time but our body has not caught up to that shift pretty much right so yet we are storing energy energy in the form of fat in the body yet we are storing the excess glucose in our body as fat reserves right so our body and our brain hasn't really adapted to that shift of the easy availability of food and the way the food is made as well back in the day sweet foods like fruits were easily available along with the fiber right what does a fruit have fructose fruit sugar along with fiber this combination keeps our blood glucose buffered but now we are eating foods that are processed we are adding synthetic sugar we are adding uh you know maida to our foods which is again processed you know wheat it is processed flour we we are throwing in all different kinds of artificial sweeteners we are making synthetic stuff we are processing our foods to a level right where it is going to cause a spike in our blood glucose followed by a crash all right so back in the day the sweet foods were good for us right because the carbs were available along with the fiber in their truest form they were available in its natural state which our body could utilize right which our body could very well recognize and actually metabolize that glucose as well but what happened over a period of time man started because of the advent of industrialization man started processing their food we started making foods in a packet we started making ready to eat items 
we started you know refining foods to a level to make it more easier to consume right so as a result our food habits changed our foods changed our food you know is not the same the crops are not the same as they were back in the day right so there are multiple changes that have taken place as well right so the reason that i'm trying to put this forward today is that we are hardwired right to pick the sweet foods because our body you know wanted to consume the body's natural intuitive signal is to consume the carb foods in its natural state to consume the protein foods in its natural state right but because of the level of processing that has taken place over the years right and also we also have evolved our gut has evolved right because of the kind of foods we are consuming somewhere there is a bit of a disconnect right so hunter gatherers learned to pick simple carbs over bitter foods because they were poisonous right so we are naturally inclined to pick the sweet foods now of course our sweet foods are not the same as they were back in the day they are much more refined so that's where the problem arises and also we are trying to maximize our survival as species right so in this whole concept of survival if i was to put the word survival here today what should we be doing we should be picking more of the sweet foods because they are better for us right and the bitter stuff is actually more poisonous so that's why we are a brain reward system also is naturally acclimatized to pick the sweet foods all right so we need to understand that there are a lot of psychological associations that are associated with foods also with cravings as well and we need to understand that this is done from a very early childhood period all right so let's say for instance when you were a kid and you were growing up what did your mother tell you or your parent tell you if you get good grades in school if you behave yourself if you try and do x y and z i will give you your favorite food i will make you eat a burger i will give you a sweet or a candy right so you are rewarding the child with something correct correct you are rewarding your child with something which is probably not the best for them right with a sweet food or a comfort food or some junk items as well right so they build a positive association that i will get rewarded with that sweet if i do a good task if i get good grades i will be rewarded with a sweet food right so since childhood we are trained psychologically to pick the sweet foods because our brain's reward system has to be activated we need that dopamine we are hardwired to want that dopamine in our body now no celebration right many of us know that when we are low we pick sweet foods yes but no celebration is complete without sweet if i take a simple diwali or a eid or a birthday or a anniversary what do we do we get a cake what do we do we eat modak what do we do we eat pera right so a lot of the celebrations culturally as well right now back in the day if i had my uh, let's say you know kheer or if i had you know gajar ka halwa or if i had gajar ka kheer right what happens back in the day it was healthy gajar right healthy carrot correct milk was much more you know it was lacking it was not containing those inflammatory pro inflammatory markers right and i had my good you know nutrients in it as well vitamin a milk was a source milk is source of fat as well so it's helping me absorb the vitamin a from the carrots right and i was using natural sugar like gourd or dates or something like that right but now in the current scenario what we're doing our milk is processed adulterated it has inflammatory markers right because our cows are being overfed with hormones and antibiotics you know our uh, let's say for instance the sugars we are using also are processed they are refined correct so the same gajar ka halwa back in the day that our moms our grandmoms used to eat is not the same it's processed right so definitely we we grew up on sweets but are our sweets the same anymore no right so yes no celebration is complete without eating something pleasurable right even the media is constantly telling us that we should be dunking our sorrows in a bowl of ice cream here you can see that you know there's a heroine sonam kapoor is really sad maybe she's had a breakup with somebody and what do we see in the advertisement that she is dunking her sorrows in the bowl of ice cream because that's what we told if you're low eat sweet if you're feeling a certain way consume something comforting 
right? It's okay to eat if you're feeling low, you know, it's okay to feel better. And I'm not saying that it's bad if you're picking up a food as a coping mechanism sometimes, but do we know when to stop? Are we mindful? No, right? So we need to understand here that constantly, right, we have been told to eat this, to not eat this, right? The diet culture also is telling us that we should go on a diet and we should go on extreme low calorie diets. What does that create in our body? A sense of restriction, right? The minute I'm told that I should not be doing X, Y, and Z, and the word diet is constantly misused, right? People tell you the word diet means one month of no sweets, no sugars, no fatty foods, uh, no fats allowed, right? No carbs, let go of roti and rice at dinner, go on a calorie restriction. No, right? The word diet does not mean starvation, right? The word diet means understanding what is fulfilling you, how to keep yourself saturated by having all the nutrients in the right amount, all right? So deprivation or depriving yourself of food also will put you in an energy deficit. If you go on a low calorie diet, what will happen? You have low, low energy. If you have low energy, your cravings will increase, right? Because your body is not saturated. In this scenario, if you're having a, you know, diet, which is, or you're having foods that are not going to be enough for you or meeting your calorific requirement to function, you know, very well or feel efficient, right? To feel better, to have better focus, better memory. Somewhere you would have more cravings, yeah? So in this scenario, deprivation, yes, leads to cravings and that is connected to hunger, right? And always the forbidden food is sweeter. The minute I am told psychologically to not eat X, Y, Z, after a month, after two months, after three months, the minute I am told to restrict something, I'll want it more, I'll crave more, right? So instead of having this, you know, concept of all or nothing, yes and no, don't eat this, don't eat that, eat this and eat this only, why can't I have a perspective where I'm keeping in mind and having an open perspective towards food? I eat all the foods, but I eat more of the foods that are good for me, right? So very important to understand that do not go by just the diet culture alone, right? Because many a times we are told to only eat in a certain fashion, only eat, you know, a particular kind of food, consume supplements, you know, consume and go on these long fast where we are detoxing our body. My friends, you do not need a detox. Your body is naturally detoxing every day. Your liver is a detox organ. Your kidney is a detox organ, all right? They are naturally eliminating waste, right? You're losing your electrolytes through sweat from your skin as well. That's detoxing as well, all right? So we do not need to go on extreme fast diets. Yes, you know, keeping a gap in between your meals is good. You're helping your body digest the food better. You're causing a bit of a deficit. We are utilizing all the energy reserves in your body, yes? So yes, some periods of fasting are good. You know, it's good to keep, your digestive system, some rest. It's good for your digestive tract and your gut to get that little bit of a breather as well, all right? But we need to understand here that going on extreme diets, fasting for long, long periods of time, only having juices and detox, uh, you know, formulas and tonics and supplements that are being, you know, uh, commercialized by many, many big companies, right? Is not the right way to go about it right? We need to understand that it's not going to help us in the long run. Maybe in the short term, you will lose weight, you will have a calorie deficit, right? But is it sustainable in the long run is something we have to ask ourselves. Is this practical for us to follow for the rest of our lives? We need to ask ourselves that question. All right. So yes, cravings are also driven by mood. And many of you all have rightly pointed that out today as well, that boredom drives cravings, right? The lack of dopamine drives cravings. Stress drives cravings as well, right? Because we are trying to overcome the stress by eating something and distracting our mind and body, all right? Not getting adequate sleep at night also makes you more hungry. Why? Does anyone know that how come sleep is connected here to hunger and cravings? Do you know that when you're running low on sleep, what happens in the morning? You start craving coffee, caffeine, tea, sugary foods, a piece of chocolate or something meetha. 
Does that happen to you in the morning when you wake up like with less sleep because you have to feel awake? You, you want to feel energetic, right? So why is your body demanding energy? Do you know that your appetite hormones called ghrelin and leptin are actually produced at night when you are asleep? All right. So if you get less sleep or you don't get good quality of sleep, how will you produce your hunger hormones? All right. The fullness and hunger hormone, ghrelin and leptin, all right? These two hormones are hunger hormones and fullness hormones. They signal your body when you are hungry and they signal your body when you're full. Now, if these two hormones are not manufactured because of lack of sleep or erratic sleep or irregular sleep, how will you know that intuitively if your body is full or not? you'll end up eating less or more in the bargain, right? If your body has no signals produced, right? To know when to stop to eat or to feel hungry, how will your body know what to eat or when to stop or how much to eat, correct? So these hunger and fullness hormones are manufactured at night. If you're running low on sleep, in the morning, whatever you see, you'll eat. You will have a craving for sugar because you want to feel awake. You're trying to make up for those hormones that are not manufactured at night by producing more dopamine and keeping your brain stimulated by keeping your neurons activated. All right. So do we understand this here that it's your brains need to constantly stay awake. And if you're not getting good sleep at night, somewhere there's a mechanism in your body that's trying to combat it, right? The lack of sleep, the lack of hormones is actually already the interplay of neurons taking place right? So what are you going to do? You're going to wake up feeling less energetic, fatigued, tired. You do not know what to eat, when to eat, when to stop. There'll be no hunger and fullness hormones. All right. So we need to understand that this emotional cycle is actually very detrimental. Why? Because our relationship with food is getting hampered. All right. We need to better our relationship with food, my friends. All right. Whenever you are upset and you eat something and you overeat, you will feel powerless over food because you are giving your control away, right? Instead, if I feel the need to eat something and if I'm upset as well, why can't I be more mindful about it? That will only happen if I acknowledge my emotions, all right? So it starts with self-awareness, all right? When I'm upset, I mindlessly pick whatever's around me and then I eat more than I should and I feel guilty after. When I feel guilty after, I'll undereat because I because I want to make up for the food that I've overeaten. And then again, the cycle of being upset and being powerless over food is activated. All right. So what do we need to understand here? We need to understand here that we can deal with cravings provided we are aware, provided we are self-aware. All right. Now, this neural pathway of a craving is very important to be understood here. All right. Before I move forward. I want everyone to take this slide in and grasp the information very, very closely. Why? Because we're going to put the practical solution to, you know, into place right now. We're going to take all the practical solutions now and put it into perspective. All right. I have a thought. There's a thought in my mind that let's say I feel like having a box of chocolates. All right. I'm craving that. The thought happens. The craving is activated. I eat that food. And then I feel guilty after, right? That's the neural pathway of a craving in your body, in your mind, right? Now, what are we, be, uh, are we being told? We are being told that we should have better willpower. So when I have the thought and the craving is activated, I should either delay it, right? I should wait for 10 minutes, wait for 15 minutes and see that, okay, if I really need to have that particular food or not, distract my mind the three d's right distract my mind by thinking about something else maybe watch something instead right or i should take up a hobby i should do some other activity call up a friend speak to somebody if i'm low right and distance myself from that craving of food keep it in a less accessible place or don't buy it in the first place don't make it a part of my grocery checklist only all right so what are we being told? We have been told by the diet culture that we should have better willpower. And have any of y'all tried this before? If you have a craving for a particular food, 
have you tried to distract yourself have you tried to distance yourself from it right and have you tried to delay it by waiting it out for a couple of minutes seeing if you know that hunger or that craving is yet persisting you know or drink some water instead yes people do that as well instead of hunger or the craving they want to fulfill it by having some water and keeping ourselves hydrated as well right so many a times we do these three d's but the question is are we always successful is this the right way to go about it maybe not always maybe for some it might work but it does not work for a lot of people right in fact what i have heard from most of my clients that i interact with that this is highly dis dysfunctional right because if i stop a craving for a particular food after a couple of minutes i'll start craving something else instead maybe maybe the next day i will have a you know uh, you know more intense craving for something that i could not meet the next day or the previous day all right so it probably does not always boil down to delaying distancing and distracting yourself right self control yes to an extent is important but it does not always work my friends so what can we do here instead when i have a thought for a craving i should be eating right i should be eating and you 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 are you're probably thinking what is karina saying out here today you know is she giving us the right information or not but yes you can eat your favorite food provided you do the better two d's you determine and you decide now what does that mean let's say you have a craving for a particular dessert or a laddu all right you see it around you right you acknowledge you're having a craving you determine how much of it you want to consume and decide that how will you consume it mindfully all right so let's say you are craving the laddu you prepare your mind okay i am craving a particular food item i will eat three bites of it mindfully enjoy the process i will fulfill my taste buds i will get the dopamine kick but i'll know when to stop right i will not get greedy and have the fifth sixth seventh eighth ninth tenth bite all right so where we are you know going wrong is the fact that we do not know when to stop we do not know how to control after we have had those one or two bites all right so this all way this this always will happen if we are not aware if you are not mindful so the first goal here my friends is to determine and decide how much of that favorite craving or that favorite food you want to consume all right and this phenomena will only take place and this awareness will only happen if you are knowing the signals of hunger and fullness right you can assess your hunger you will know when to stop remember it is very important to understand that whenever we are eating our foods as well we should not be eating in a hurry the minute we eat big big portions of foods and we gulp it down without chewing on it our amylase enzyme is not activated if your amylase enzyme is not activated your brain does not even get a signal that you are eating right so if your digestion is not taking place in your mouth because that's the first place for digestion then your food goes undigested or indigested food and that will lead to belching burping gas acidity other issues you will not even know how much you've eaten there's no mindfulness here involved so remember chewing your food knowing when to stop right knowing your hunger and fullness signal not waiting until you are very very hungry many of us if we are not having fixed timing of our meals as well let's say every day at 1 pm i consume my lunch and i'm not being mindful of that and i delay my hunger i keep delaying it until i am super hungry then i'll eat whatever comes my way i'll gulp it down in a jiffy right and then i'll be uncomfortably full and feel extremely extremely fatigued also and tired because i've eaten more than my body should actually need my body demands so remember the act of mindfulness here determine how much of your favorite comfort food you want to eat eat three bites of it and wait for 3 to 4 minutes after if you want to go for the fourth fifth and sixth bite all right so what is the rule out here my friends determine decide and three by three rule has to be followed i always tell people in a buffet as well when you go and you have a spread of food instead of picking up 10 desserts pick your favorite food 
pick your favorite dessert one of one item from the you know buffet the spread eat three bites of it ask yourself after a couple of minutes do i need more all right so it's not about completely you know stopping yourself and always keeping a will power and always keeping a self control mechanism you can consume food that you enjoy as well because food is a enjoyable experience right of course if you have a illness like diabetes hypertension a medical problem of course then you have to be careful about your eating habits right another important technique here when you have a craving you can substitute it with a smarter food or a healthier food option all right so let's say you have a craving for a sweet food right there are many sweet foods as well which can be a healthier substitute right i know many of us do not like eating our fruits and our dates and our nuts and our seeds and our raisins but there are ways to make your food palatable as well healthy foods does not mean soups and salads it does not mean to eat raw it can be very well accommodated provided you have the knowledge to consume the right foods how to make it more palatable tasty healthy foods are tasty too we need to acknowledge that first all right so when we are bored when we are feeling low when we have lack of sleep right our appetite goes up because our body is demanding that dopamine kick we want that pleasure to be derived from food right so what are some healthier substitutes here let's say you love having popcorn all right what can you do instead you can pick up a bowl of makhana dry roast it with some seeds nuts make a bale out of it throw in your favorite chutney if you like spicy food make a spicy chutney if you like sweet food make a tamarind or date paste chutney or a khajoor paste chutney if you like eating let's say ch uh, chivda you can take your kurmura or your puffed rice you know throw it without a sieve in your favorite uh, vegetables make a bale out of it or make a chaat out of it put your potatoes put your veggies like your tomatoes cucumber add more fiber add a protein source like some seeds some nuts make it more rich make it more satiating right that's the way you should be ideally consuming your foods if you are feeling that you are running low on sleep as well what can you do instead make your sleep quality better before going to bed time have a cup of warm milk or warm water add a little bit of ashwagandha to it or turmeric and black pepper to feel much more better ashwagandha is a adaptogen it helps you adapt to the stress levels you feel better you feel more calmer right so you can definitely try these simple tips and tricks before going to bed time as well have a little bit of chamomile tea it's a herbal tea some warm water with some cinnamon nutmeg even that works perfectly fine all right these smart substitutes will really help you soothe your cravings right and you will feel better as well right i'm not saying you completely undereat and always distract yourself and always delay hunger you can definitely for those of us you know who like sweet as i said you can consume a little bit of uh, you know take a little bit of jaggery or date paste you know you can dry roast it with your favorite seeds or favorite nuts you can have it in, in between as a snack you can take your favorite fruit like a banana or apple have it with some nut butter like a peanut butter almond butter I mean, that's a great snack to be had right you can take some yogurt and you can add your favorite fruit on top like strawberries berries make it like a nice yogurt parfait and have that instead right whenever you are super stressed eat more magnesium rich foods what are magnesium foods magnesium is a calming mineral even those who go to the gym right and they work out in uh, they work out for a good one one and a half hours post working out their muscles are sore their muscles are tight right so what do you do to calm your muscles to ease any stress in the body you have magnesium rich foods and magnesium is present in the highest amount in pumpkin seeds in oats in walnuts and almonds so all your nuts and seeds are magnesium rich all right so i would suggest that all of y'all have a holistic meal plate pattern include good portion of not just your you know fruits veggies your whole grains your protein rich foods your nuts and seeds right your probiotic as well remember your gut is the place where your happy hormones are manufactured so for all of y'all who think that the gut is only the area where digestion takes place you are mistaken gut is where dopamine serotonin endorphin oxytocin all these hormones are manufactured imagine if your gut is not healthy 
how will you feel better how will you feel in a better mood so we need to eat more gut friendly foods and eating more probiotic rich foods will actually feed our gut better it will keep our gut healthy it will maintain a biosis in our gut a balance in our gut all right what is our gut it's the entire gastrointestinal tract right from our mouth to our esophagus up till our excretory organs all right so there are millions of bacteria residing in our gut and we have to feed the gut by having more probiotics and prebiotics so consume your yogurt buttermilk fermented vegetables have more of your veggies have your whole grains with the fiber the trick is to eat a holistic meal and consume all the nutrients in the right proportion to each other correct so we need to snack correctly as well whenever we feel the need to have a food item i told you there are smart substitutes and earlier also we have mentioned how when you have a craving for a particular food option you can make it and turn it into a smart snack all right remember to combine your protein with your fiber rich items why is it important protein and fiber together will ensure your hunger stays at bay your hunger and your hunger basically is met and you are satiated it will buffer your blood glucose which will provide you satiety for a longer period of time it will keep you fuller for a longer period of time let's say you only eat one banana at 4 or 5 pm do you think that will be enough to keep your hunger at bay no banana yes it has potassium it has uh, fructose which is a fruit sugar it has fiber but there's no protein right so the ideal way to snack is to take a protein food and your protein foods could be all your lentils legumes sprouts makhana yogurt butter milk nut butters any of these protein foods combine that with a fiber rich fruit or veggie this combination is a complementary combination like a jay and viru ki jodi which can always be remembered and you can always consume your snacks in this fashion to keep your blood glucose buffered to keep your cravings at bay and to be satiated all right so remember this combination of protein plus fiber a simple example here i have given you is of a sprouted moong chaat any lentil boil it combine it with vegetables protein in the lentil in the sprouts vegetables have fiber protein and fiber together will keep your blood glucose buffered all right why because protein and fiber they they actually behave like a speed breaker to your blood glucose they don't cause a spike and a fall in your blood glucose keeping you fuller for a longer period of time keeping you healthier as well all right so remember <clears throat> whenever you have uh, you know a craving and i've given a simple example out here as well one such way to tackle a craving is by including a smart substitute all right so we have discussed a couple of you know uh, important mechanisms and strategies the first one was of course to delay distract right and the second one was to determine you know and decide how much of the food you want to eat the 3 by 3 rule and the third example here of managing your cravings is to eat a smarter substitute instead all right so the next time whenever we have you know a thought to consume some uh, favorite show on you know netflix or we have a thought of let's say many of us have a habit of watching news and also eating food we have a habit of watching a video on our phones or whatsapp videos and also eating and i have a craving for sweet food what can i do instead keep a smart substitute next to my tv or next to my laptop or next to my work desk the minute you keep the smart substitute you'll be visually cute to pick that instead all right so surround yourself visually cue yourself with the smart substitutes already and that will only happen with planning make a grocery checklist at the, at the beginning of the week and prepare that and keep it around you all right now another important mechanism here is to be more mindful and i told everybody in the beginning as well mindfulness before you have the craving itself you can be more mindful right today we associate let's say waking up in the morning to brushing the minute i wake up in the morning i use the washroom i go to the washroom i brush my teeth that's the first cue i have when i wake up in the morning right so similarly we are this is a hardwired 
association because we have subconsciously trained ourselves to do this. How about even for cravings or even for foods, we make this make this association. If I'm somebody who doesn't have enough water, I keep a bottle of water next to my bedside, next to my alarm clock. Whenever I wake up in the morning, I shut my alarm clock. I see the bottle of water. Right? The minute I see it, I'm visually cued. I pick it up and have it instead. All right? So there are ways to make habitual changes, my friends. It's only about being a little smart about it and acknowledging it. All right? So mindfulness is not only about being mindful about how much to eat, but also being in tune with your body signals. All right? If I'm feeling the urge, let's say I'm having an emotion or having an emotional breakdown, I'm having an anxious moment. And on an everyday basis, I do get some moments of stress as well. What can I do? If I feel the need to have something and I need to, you know, stuff my face with food and, you know, kind of many a times we have this intense desire that we have to stuff our face with food because I want to calm my emotion down. So instead, what can we do? Sit down, focus in the moment ground yourself, take a few sips of water, try and do some deep breathing for 5-10 minutes and ask yourself, do I really need to consume this food? Am I consuming this particular food item in response to hunger or in response to cravings? Is it my body's need for energy or is it my brain's need for a reward? All right. This will only happen, my friends, if you are in tune with your body's intuitive signals. All right, so tame your stress levels. Try and follow a meditation technique or a hobby or a sport or a yoga, whatever is your favorite, you know, way of, you know, just disconnecting. What is your favorite approach where you are in tune with your body, when you give time to yourself, self-care, self-awareness, right? Even in a day's time, if you clock in 15, 20 minutes of just absolutely no distraction, right and just tuning into your body's intuitive signals you'll be much more in control of your urges you'll be much more in tune with what your body is wanting all right your body signals you provided you know how to pick those signals all right awareness is a very very big is playing a very very big role in cravings as well all right the minute you are aware you can actually turn the craving around by just being self-aware right? If you're feeling low, definitely I would say get help. There are many ways to, you know, <clears throat> get help as well, whether you speak to your partner or a family member or get professional support as well, right? Whatever is your mechanism to deal with it, please try and, you know, act upon that, execute that, right? Even having a hunger reality check is so important because I told most of you all that True hunger or physical hunger is very different compared to real hunger, uh, very different compared to emotional hunger, my friends. All right. So let's say physical hunger is when your body is craving energy. You'll, you'll eat whatever comes your way because you're so hungry. But emotional hunger is a craving for a specific food item only. And in these scenarios, as I said, you need to take up the different mechanisms of dealing with the craving. All right. Either you Cave into the craving, determine how much of it you want to eat and then stop. Or then you eat a smarter substitute or then you wait it out, delay, distract, right? Which does not always work as well, all right? So always understand that true hunger, right, is your body genuinely wanting energy. And that time your, your stomach will start growling. You'll eat whatever comes your way. Even if it's the most, uh, you know, your, your least favorite food item. If you're truly hungry, you'll consume it right? But if it's a craving, if it is an emotion, emotional attachment to food, or if it is the hunger coming from an emotional space, you will only want that specific item. All right? Follow a few of these lifestyle habits, plan your meals, make exercise your priority because it releases feel-good chemicals in your body called endorphins to reduce stress, to keep your emotions in control, to boost your mood as well, get adequate sleep at night because that's when your hunger hormones are manufactured. Remember to eat meals timely because if you keep gaps in between your meals, that will also leave you more vulnerable to cravings. You will have more of an urge. And always look at the ideal meal plate pattern, my friends. It is so important that we follow this meal plate pattern. It has not been devised by me. It has been devised by the ICMR, the Indian Council of Medical Research in India. All right. So we have 
this ideal meal plate pattern that has been devised based on statistics and the population demographics based on an average Indian male or female, how should we be consuming our food? Our plate should be lot, filled with a lot of vegetables. At least 50% of our plate should be some kind of sabzi, veggies in whatever form that we like, right? At least 30% of our plate should be a protein source. All right, lentils, legumes, eggs, uh, nuts, seeds, sprouts, tofu, soya bean, whatever we like eating, right? And whole grains, not your refined grains, should also be a part of your meals, like your roti, your millets, your rice, 20% uh, of your plate, preferably whole with the fiber retained, with the fiber maintained in that particular grain or carbohydrate. And of course, along with this meal plate pattern, throw in a probiotic, you know, your fats are the foods that you're cooking your foods in. The oil being used, if it is virgin, unrefined, it is far better than your refined oils. So I always tell my clients as well that please try and eat in a holistic meal plate, uh, you know, meal plate, uh, you know, approach. Have this approach of moderation and variety in your meals and follow this pattern of eating because that's going to keep you saturated. It's going to make you feel more fuller, make you feel more efficient, better memory, better focus and better health, right? So always maintain this approach. And of course, this percentages will differ based on each individual on your health goals and your medical history, genetic makeup, it's highly, you know, subjective. But this is a good, you know, understanding to have how to at least approach your meal. It's a good blueprint to keep in mind. All right. Great. So with that, we'll open the forum for Q&A now. Uh, you can launch the, you know, poll as well, Ekta. And uh, in case anybody has any questions for me, any queries for me, I think in the Q&A box, there is a question or two. I will try and address them, you know, to my best capacity. And uh, if you have any feedback for me as well, I would love to hear from you all. Uh, I've given you all a couple of mechanisms to deal with emotions, uh, you know, to deal with cravings as well, how to conquer your cravings by acknowledging them. And of course, after you acknowledge them, how to be more mindful of it, how to have smarter substitutes, you know, simple ways to approach cravings as well. So I really hope this session was useful. Uh, you're going to go home with, you know, some important key points that will be of use to you in the future as well. Thank you so much, Karina, for this, for it's such an interactive and enlightening webinar. I think many of us here agree that the information which you have provided, uh, tips and tricks, uh, how we can manage our cravings and will definitely make a long lasting positive change in our lives. So, so we can move to a Q&A question. And if anyone from the participation also wants to have a questions uh, directly, can raise their hand so that we can move to your panelists and you can directly ask uh, your queries to uh, Karina directly. All right. So uh, let me try and address the question. Okay. Maybe if Sai Kiran wants to ask us, we can listen to her question first. Uh, Sai Kiran, you can unmute yourself and you can ask your question. No, just the thing is that I would like to appreciate Karina on our patience for a beautiful insights. It's really enlightening to us. Thank you, Karina. Yeah, thanks. So definitely, thanks. if there are any further queries, definitely we will approach you and follow you. Thanks for the valuable insights, Karina. My pleasure. I'm glad it was useful and it was uh, you know insightful as well. Definitely, we will try to implement it. At least uh, might not be the hundred percent, but at least. Uh, starting 5% or the 10% for a period of time. Thank Great. you. Thank you so much, Sai Kiran. That was so generous of you to come on the panel and give us a feedback. So in case anyone else also wants to give us a feedback, uh, let us know. We'll move you to the panel. We have one more, uh, Mr. Sai Kotha. You can unmute yourself and you can yeah, ask the question. Yeah, yeah, actually, this session is very nice. And uh, most of the times I have cravings of chocolates and late night cravings. So it helped me understand how my mood affects and emotional status. What I feel is, you know, in next session or any time, uh, previously also I tried this kind of debt, but later what we'll feel is I'm a bachelor. Later, what we'll feel is we'll feel very lazy to have all the items in place for every meal, right? And uh, I suffered with uh, 
lot of options for proteins. If we are veg, you have a lot of challenges to select proteins and a lot of challenges to select. For non-veg also, you have. I feel that for a person like me, right, uh, I don't want to put a lot of effort in preparing my meal. So I feel when I see the picture, right, it is colorful. At the same time, I, I feel that it is a lot of effort. So in, a, in any next session, if you have any list like veg protein, non-veg protein, snacks, nuts, and all, right? I think it right. will be very helpful for a lot of lazy people like me. Absolutely. No, I agree with you because many of us, if we are working and, you know, if you're single-handedly managing, you know, the house and work as well, it becomes a bit of a challenge, you know, for many of us to keep a check on not just our eating habits, but also at times we, we do cave into our cravings too. So as I said, you know, the, uh, the healthy food that we're consuming or the healthy substitutes don't have to be complex. It doesn't require a lot of pre-preparation as well, right? In fact, some healthy foods can be prepared over the weekend and kept for the entire week. You can also buy healthy snacks and, you know, stock your pantry so that whenever you have hunger or whenever even the craving strikes, you already have a substitute, you know, which is around you at your disposal. Whenever you feel the need to have that craving, you pick that instead. So some options, you know, which are not requiring any preparation could be things like makhana, right? All you have to do is just buy it off the market, dry roast it and keep it. You in fact get the roasted versions in the market as well, which are flavored with some herbs and spices and good and makhana as well, right? So you can buy one such option. Second option, as I said, for some people who do not eat fruits, right? You can buy dates and keep kajur. Kajur is a sweet option and it has the good sugar along with the fiber, potassium and iron packed in it, right? So you're getting yeah. natural sugar, you're getting a natural sweetness as well along with the fiber, which will keep your blood glucose buffered, all right? You can even now, in fact, in chocolates as well, we have now because of, you know, the innovation of people, you know, there is some chocolates available which are dark in nature, 70% or more of cocoa along with some nuts and seeds as well right so you're getting nowadays chocolates that are available in the market which are going to you know saturate your cravings as well without having you know to bear the brunt of it being unhealthy right so yeah. uh, as i said it's all about putting a little bit of thought to your foods you know even a simple thing like you know if you're feeling a little more hungry you can even have a sandwich right like why does a sandwich have to be unhealthy the minute you throw in a protein of your choice you know a sandwich takes five minutes to assemble any leftover vegetables from your fridge can be, you know, uh, clocked in. You can nicely make a chutney of your choice or keep a chutney in your fridge. You know, use any base of hummus or hung yogurt or chutney of your choice. You can throw in vegetables of your choice. Any protein, like even a soya bean can be boiled and kept in the fridge. Whenever you want, just add it. Sprouts can be steamed and kept in the fridge. Whenever you want, add it for protein in your meals. Sattu, which is a roasted chickpea flour for a person like you who's vegetarian, works wonders. All right. So you can buy these, you know, items and keep in your pantry or stock up your pantry with these foods and just whip up a nice sandwich. You know, keep an open toast instead of having double the you know amount of refined bread. There are 100% whole wheat variety also available. Even though that's not the best option, I would say that, yes, once in a while, why not, right? Throw in your protein, add your fiber. The minute you throw in this combination, right, you're keeping yourself saturated. Your blood glucose state stays buffered. As opposed to only having a toast alone, your blood glucose goes up and falls like a roller coaster. All right. The trick is to throw in vegetables, throw in the fiber, add the protein to keep your blood glucose buffered, to keep saturated and also be fulfilled. Yeah. Thanks, Karina. I have one last question. So my question is, when we are young, right, when we are teenage or less than that age, we don't know about protein fiber reach and our parents also don't know. At the time, we, we didn't feel this much mood swings or cravings or anything even if we eat also we don't have any health related problems mm -hmm. but what what is changed in this uh, generation or when we are growing right why we need to consider more about every meal protein fiber because when we are ch children or in our college days we don't know all these things right generally as a nutritionist what you feel that uh, uh, changing when we are aging right so firstly, the number one thing that we need to understand is as we age as well, our metabolism is slowing down. In fact, after 30, the muscle mass is being lost every year by 2%, all right? So we need to definitely understand that we are losing muscle mass, right, as we're aging. 
Number two, our metabolism is slowing down, right? Your reproductive hormones, when you hit puberty, right? They they are surging, right? In your teens, they are surging, your, your reproductive hormones. At mm. a certain age, like for, for instance, women, they, they, they reach menopause, right? After that, it becomes very difficult to lose weight for most women because it's hormonally connected, right? Mm. So I would say that, yes, why protein, fiber? In fact, for a young adult as well, you should be eating healthy. I'm not going to advise that people who are young, they are more vulnerable. Of course, you're exposed to more outside food because you are less bothered about your food because you are in a space when you're younger, but your metabolism is in your favor. All right. Because you are young, your body is able to take it. But with age, you're not just facing more free radical damage. There's more oxidation taking place in your body. Metabolism is slowing down. So definitely those factors are not in your favor. That's why for a person who's aging, I would say that, you know, a little bit of movement, clocking in that, you know, good amount of fiber, protein becomes more important for digestion, you know, for lean muscle mass preservation and things like that. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Karen. Yeah. I'm good to have you. Thank you. Perfect. Perfect. All right. Karina, we have seven questions under the Q&A section. Oh, yes. Sorry. Let me try and address those. So uh, we have a question from somebody that said, I had uh, my first child delivered. However, I am not uh, having enough sleep. I'm having disturbed sleep. And since then, I always get midnight cravings uh, and I fall prey to unhealthy snacks, uh, which has led to weight gain. I can't control that. And can you guide me how I should overcome my midnight cravings? And if not overcome, then what quick snack should I have in midnight to satisfy my hunger? Great. So somebody who has just gone through, uh, you know, pregnancy, uh, postpartum, I would definitely say number one important thing we need to address is that our energy demands are yet high. When you're lactating for a couple of months, at least six months post-pregnancy as well, six to eight months post, your energy demands are going to be high because the nutrition is coming from your breast milk, all right? So just like in pregnancy, we take care of our health, you know, we eat the right kind of foods. And I'm not saying you overeat, but you eat just the um, right amount to keep yourself saturated and to be in a healthy state. Similarly, in that lactation period as well, it is important to eat the right kind of foods. If you're having disturbed sleep, I would definitely say try and incorporate ashwagandha. Ashwagandha is a very, very good Ayurvedic herb along with turmeric and a little bit of cinnamon and nutmeg in your milk or warm water. So suppose before bedtime or before putting your child to sleep, you're giving her a feed, you're giving him a feed, you're going to bed you know, along with the child, you're having a disturbed, you know, interrupted sleep. I would say that before going to bedtime, take that ashwagandha in warm water or add turmeric haldi dood with black pepper, cinnamon, nutmeg. It's a great, great, great option to make you feel better. All right, to sleep better as well. If you're having cravings for chatpata food or savory or spicy food, I would definitely say, say keep healthier snacks next to your uh, bedside or wherever you're feeding your child. Uh, a good option for, for you could be a trouble right which is soft uh throw in some you know uh methi kadana also methi seeds as well dry roast it with any of your you know puffed rice or makhana or you can even you know make it into a nice bale and keep whenever you feel the need that you're feeling of having a savory item or a midnight snack just have that savory snack, a dry snack, or with a chutney, or with a vegetable, as I said, in a chart form or a bale form with some yogurt, right? That can be done for your midnight cravings, all right? So whilst midnight cravings are normal, because anyways, your entire pattern of sleeping is interrupted because of your child's feeding pattern, I would say do not get overwhelmed. Acknowledge that this is just a temporary phase. Keep the healthier options around you. As I said, whatever you like eating, you know, try and keep it next to your bedside. Bedside. If, for instance, as I said, you know, you like savory foods. In savory, there are so many options, right? You can even take uh, a simple option like even puffed rice. You can take a simple option like, you know, even uh, your makhana can be kept with some seeds and nuts and just dry roasted and kept next to your bedside. Whenever you feel the need to eat something, then pick that instead. All right? Okay. Uh, we have a question from someone that says, uh, sometimes uh, we feel <clears throat> pressurized. We can only calm down with sweets. So as I said, I've given you plenty of options to consume some healthier versions of sweets as well. 
you know make your homemade dessert you can make foods that are sweet as well you know without the refined sugar you can use a little bit of date paste or khajoor ka paste to add to your dessert to your smoothies to your laddus you can use a little bit of cinnamon and nutmeg those are also sweet as well throw in a fruit in your yogurt make it like a yogurt parfait so there are ways of consuming sweet foods right without having to bear the brunt of the refined processed items right so it's all about putting a little thought to your foods okay okay so i think we've addressed uh, could you please tell us what is the best food for having good sleep i think i've already addressed it um <clears throat> keep your magnesium rich foods next to your bedside keep your nuts and seeds especially walnuts and almonds and cashews uh, apart from that the ashwagandha warm water in warm milk is a very good remedy uh, apart from that i would say that if you have trouble falling asleep at night keep your room you know you know in a very cold dark environment keep the curtains drawn sleep in an environment where you're very very uh secure you know keep your <clears throat> gadgets away at least 30 minutes before bedtime shut down the blue light because that interferes with the sleep hormone as well listen to relaxing music have chamomile tea those all are great remedies for a good night sleep all right and don't have caffeine too close to bedtime another important thing that we do we have caffeine coffee tea energy drinks too close to bedtime which interferes with the sleep hormone release all right great um okay we have someone ask us while uh, controlling cravings sometimes we feel we cannot use the brain when we feel cravings uh okay so i think the question here is that uh, you cannot help you know control your cravings just by mindfulness so as i said you know there are substitutes as well you do not have to always uh you know control or use will power and uh, you, you you have to you know, not feel guilty after you know as i said one does not have to fall in that trap of feeling powerless over food so whenever you do have a craving and you feel your brain is not able to resist that as i said follow the 3 by 3 rule stop no when to stop or else look for a healthier substitute or keep a healthier substitute next to you so that you consume that instead all right great uh we have someone ask us how would uh, how could how could be the what could be the best food for a one year old baby um again a one year old baby uh, you know i would say weaning foods you know semi solids because you're just trying to introduce all the solid foods in their body and uh, seeing if they're okay with it i would say try with semi solids first like you know mashed uh, you know veggies or a broth or a porridge or a ragi ka dalia or something which is basically very very light for their stomach all right so use more semi solids you know use more of you know broths and porridges uh, first and then start introducing solid little by little all right for children i would say a one year old definitely things like ragi which is rich in calcium uh, you know like a, a carrot and a cucumber soup or a broth or you know mashed potato all these are very very good to be given as well you can try those all right and nowadays you <clears throat> you have plenty of information available also so try and introduce you know your child with you know one food at a time and see how they respond to it all right kichdi is a good option as well um okay <clears throat> we have a question about is there any diet plan for women for, for women post pregnancy okay so as i said uh, you know don't try and rush into weight loss after pregnancy many of us have been told by the diet culture we have to look a certain way uh, we have to be thin and we have to you know get back in shape quickly understand you are yet providing the nutrition for your child so give your body at least a good 4 to 5 months all right I, you know in my opinion 6 months is a good period of time and you can always follow it up whilst you're feeding your child as well you're whilst you're breastfeeding and lactating you can always clock in some physical movements so i would not say that you do physical movement of the level where you're going you know uh, intense on the physical activity but definitely you can have a routine of 30 minutes of physical you know physical movement every day some kind of walking brisk walking jogging can be done based on your own energy levels on your own parameters your own biological it's check doctor do your 
kind or whoever is you know a, a trustful professional to consult and then get advice from them what is the right way to go about it but definitely don't start weight loss or don't go on restrictive calorie uh, you know calorific diets at least you know four to five months after your pregnancy wait it out let your body because when you're breastfeeding as well naturally also your body your body is burning fat all right so don't stress too much about it because anyways you're in a period of postpartum and you're going through all these hormonal fluctuations so wait it out for four five months and then you can start the weight loss regimen slowly and gradually all right okay so i'll try and address one more question and then we'll try and wrap up because it will be five o'clock soon um okay let's see what is the important question that i have not been able to address here um Okay, so we have someone ask us, we why don't we have to eat food while watching something on the TV laptop? I have a bad habit of it. So as I said, uh, you know, many of us have a habit of, you know, consuming some media whilst we're eating. The problem with that is that we do not know how much food is going in our body. So the, the signal of hunger and fullness is actually lost because you're tuned, your body is in tune with what you're watching, right? You're totally focused on what you're watching. So the fullness and hunger signal that should be ideally be present, that you know when to stop is lost, all right? And many of us, if we are watching something and eating, we're basically lost in that media where we don't know that how we are chewing our food, how our food is going down our stomach. And in fact, if you're chewing faster and you're not chewing properly and you're just gulping your food down as well, it's going to land up, you know, causing acidity, belching, burping, because you're swallowing air, all right? There are many other harmful effects as well because you do not know how much you're consuming. What's going to end up happening in the bargain? You'll end up eating more or less in the bargain. The hunger and fullness signals, the fullness signal, for instance, takes 20 minutes, all right? So if you are someone, you know, who can eat their food or their meal, you know, with all their senses engaged, right? And, and, you know, watch something very well and good. But if you're mindlessly looking at the screen and you're not bothered about what you're eating, then of course I would say that be more mindful and assess what you're eating. At least look at the food and it's an enjoyable experience. Don't you want to enjoy that art of eating and also engage with the food as well? It's very important. All right. <clears throat> All right. So... Should we wrap up or should we take one last question? Uh, I think we can wrap up. You have already been patient enough. We have <laughs> stretched beyond time. Thank you so much for your patience and for taking all the questions so patiently. Uh, so everyone, uh, we cannot answer all the questions in this one session. If you want more sessions like these or if you want a session by Karina, you can let us know. In the chat box, you can share with us over an email also, and we will arrange one session again. And uh, let's wrap it up. Thank you, Karina, so much for your time, valuable insights. I have myself jotted down certain points, and I'll make, uh, I'll be conscious and aware of what's happening to me next time. I crave for a bag of chips. <laughs> I know now. Thank you so much. And people, if you think this is difficult, so I mean, like everything in life is difficult, right? Taking the first breath when you come out of the womb, learning to, you know, walk, attending school, learning ABC. So everything is difficult, but we do have to, you know, learn it anyway. So give it a shot and we'll meet next Friday. We have a session specifically dedicated to intermittent fasting. So if anybody is interested, do join the session register. And we'll catch up again soon with Karina for another session. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful, wonderful evening ahead and a great weekend. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you for listening.